From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Philip Martin, Johnny. I've got a job for you. Fine. What is it? Uh, Mr. Carl Baskerville is insured with us. I've heard the name. A retired, wealthy. That's the best way. Well, his brother is the beneficiary. Baskerville called us a little while ago and said he wanted the money to go to a charity in case of his death. What made him change his mind? He thinks his brother's out to kill him. Oh, that's Johnny. What do you want me to do? He's insured for a half a million, Johnny. You just made me a bodyguard. At least until we found out how true Baskerville's story is. We did some checking. Six years ago, he sent his brother William to prison for absconding with company funds. William was released from state prison a week ago. Oh, yeah. That's where I've heard the name. I remember the case. Oh, it's a strange setup. Sends his brother to jail, names him as beneficiary. Wants it changed because he says his brother's going to kill him. Cain and Abel really started something, didn't they? <laughs> Edmund O'Brien in the transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Columbia Oil Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Baskerville matter. Expense account item one, 38.87, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York after receiving from you the necessary information concerning Mr. Carl Baskerville. Expense account item two, 7.50, cab fare between Grand Central and Baskerville's home on Long Island. The house was set back from the road, hidden by tall trees and surrounded by several acres of well-kept lawns and gardens. I walked up the long gravel path to the front door and knocked. I lit a cigarette and waited. The afternoon sun was warm on the back of my neck, and the air smelled of wet grass and bright flowers. Yes? I turned around to see the biggest man since Goliath. He was close to seven feet and must have weighed in at about 280. He was nice-looking and wearing a well-cut blue suit, probably made from the best part of a tent. Can I do something for you? Bend over. I'm getting a stiff neck. I'm Johnny Dollar. I'm here representing... Oh, yes. Columbia, all risk. They called and said you were on your way. Come in. I'm Mr. Baskerville's personal secretary. Mr. Baskerville is expecting you. The big man led the way through the big house, through the big French door that opened on the big garden. Carl Baskerville was sitting in a chair, feeding the birds. He was reaching his late fifties with the sour look of a man that didn't want to. And as he tossed the breadcrumbs out on the gravel walk, a big diamond on his little finger flashed in the sun. Um, Mr. Baskerville. Uh -huh. What's up? Oh, Collins. Uh, who's that with you? The uh, man from the insurance company. Uh -huh. Pull up a chair and sit down, young man. Thanks. What's your name? Dollar, Johnny Dollar, Mr. Baskerville. Ah, yeah, it's your company called, eh? I'm just feeding you little birds. Yeah, birdie. Birdie! I've been doing it for some time now. Yes, well. Yeah, what are you standing around for, Collins? I want to talk to Mr. Dollar in private. Oh, yes, sir. If you need me, I'll be in the study. I won't need you. Uh, yes, sir. How tall is he? Six feet nine inches. He's been with me for some time. I've been retired for five years, Mr. Dollar. I always wanted to spend my afternoons in the garden feeding the birds. I used to get up at six and go to work and have breakfast and look out of that window. Right over there, I used to see the little birds. I always said that someday I'd spend my afternoons out here feeding the little fellow. I'm really glad you made it. Right. Mr. Baskerville, I was sent here. I know why you were sent here. Sit down. Mr. Dollar, I'm 57. I spent most of my life making money, making a success of myself. Success in terms of what you consider success. That's an interesting statement. How is it? Why do you say that? How do you know what I consider the norm of success? Isn't money important to you? Sure, it has to be. How important? Very, but not all important. Oh, yes, sir. What else is important to you, Mr. Dollar? Mm, a lot of things. Don't be evasive. Tell me something. A philosophy. Oh, I see. I see. What kind of a philosophy? Not taking people for granted. Oh, I see. Here, you feed the birds for a while. Go on, go on, go on. Don't you feel real good? 
Good. Here, Bertie. Bertie. Oh, that's fine. That's Get a load of that one. He thinks he's a pheasant. Uh, yes, he's a green when he always does that. They're a lot like people, aren't they? Mm. I suppose you know about my brother, Mr. Dollar. William Baskerville. Worked for you six years ago. Supposedly took some company funds. <laughs> Definitely took some. One hundred thousand dollars. Sent to state prison for ten years. Was paroled last week after serving six. You're insured with Columbia all risk for a half million, and your brother is the beneficiary. That is correct. Now you want to change. That is again correct. You want to tell me some more about your brother? <laughs> your company's worried. Is that it? Half million dollars worth. I suppose you consider it strange I'd send my brother to prison and then make him my beneficiary. I guess strange is a good word. I don't particularly care if you believe this or not, but I hated to prosecute my brother. But he was guilty, and it became more than just a family matter. There were stockholders to be considered, and his guilt was discovered before I could do anything. Uh, you're not feeling your bird. I'm out of crumbs. Oh, here, here. Take some, right here. Now, feed that little fellow out here. Ah, he's the timid one. He doesn't get as much as the other. You know, you're right about them being like people. The timid ones never get enough and generally fall by the wayside. You made your brother your beneficiary, and now you want to change it. Yeah, well, only as a precaution. With my money out of the way, perhaps William will think twice before he attempts anything foolish. I'm having my will changed, too. You see, I originally left my entire estate to him. What makes you think he might try? Uh, this letter. Yeah, this way down. Okay. I spent five years hitting you, but I learned to trade. I used it drawing blueprints for your shroud. Uh, poor William. I always did go for the dramatic. When did you get this? I got it yesterday. It's the first I've heard from William since he left prison. Well, we'll never get a Pulitzer Award. Yeah, William always did go in for the dramatic. Since boyhood, he's envied my get up and go. We never got along. It was even too much for my poor mother. She died very young. Probably overworked from knitting straight jackets. What's that? Don't be flippant, young man. That was uncalled for. Yeah, I guess it was. And I have a strange habit of getting flippant when I get confused. I'm confused, Mr. Baskerville. Yeah, yeah. Well, William is the last of the Baskervilles. Hothead, childish, weak, and insecure. But he's a Baskerville. If he kills me, he'll be caught. If he doesn't gain by my untimely death, he may reconsider. I still have hopes of a reconversion, so to speak. The regeneration of a Baskerville. If you will. Perhaps when he calms down and forgets his last six years, we'll talk. And then I plan on renaming him as my sole heir. Uh -huh. <laughs> Are you still confused, Mr. Dollar? You haven't contacted him? I told you you didn't know where I was. Somebody out looking for him? Of course not. Why? Because I think somebody should be. If you're going to remove the temptation, it might be a good idea to inform William. How's he going to know he's been momentarily disinherited? Man? Yes, Mr. Baskerville? Well, I must admit. Uh, if you don't want to call the police, I'd suggest a private detective. Yes, but there's no telling how much time. It's better than feeding the birds. Can you think of anyone who might know where your brother is? Well, perhaps he was a girl before William went to prison. I'm not even sure she's still in New York. What's her name? Carter. Virginia Carter. Lived someplace in the village. I only met her once, six years ago. And hire yourself a good private detective in a hurry and tell him about this Virginia Carter. She might know where William is. Yeah, all right. In the meantime, I'd recommend that the change of beneficiary be hurried up. Oh, I'm getting tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm finish feeding my birds. Yeah, sure. Good day, Mr. Garrett. Oh, uh, here. I had a few crumbs left over. Oh, oh, okay. Hey, buddy. sitting with his friends. He'd have one good deed to take along with him. I went back through the French doors and started back through the house. I got as far as the hallway. It's Baskerville. Oh, swell. He was sitting in the chair with a bullet hole just over his heart. His head was resting on his chest and he still held the breadcrumbs in his hand. He seemed to be smiling like he knew he was going to be able to feed the birds for a long time. Mr. Baskerville! Mr. Baskerville! 
Good Lord. Where were you? What? Where were you? In the library. I heard the shot. I saw William. Where? Over there at the far end of the garden. He had a gun. He, he turned and ran. That's called homicide. <laughs> Homicide. Lieutenant, this is Johnny Dollar. Well, hello. Haven't heard from you in a month. I've got a killing for you. Who? I'm out at the Baskerville estate. The Baskerville? He used to be Carl Baskerville. He was shot a few minutes ago in his garden. Oh, William did it. I saw William with a gun. What? Baskerville's secretary says he saw William Baskerville with a gun. The brother? The one who just got out of state? That's right. I'm here because Carl thought William was going to kill him. He showed me a letter. Holy... A letter? Get out here. I think I just made the mistake of my career. I shoved Collins aside and ran back out in the garden. Basketball was still smiling and things looked about the same. I went through his coat pockets and found what I was looking for. Nothing. A threatening letter from William was gone. I went back in the library faster than I'd come out. I remembered what Basketball had said about a girl named Carter. I grabbed a phone book on a wild hunch and started looking up the Carters in Greenwich. Only one Virginia in that part of town, so I said a quiet prayer to the gods that be, visioned my employer's reaction when they found out their investigator had been on hand when they lost a cool half million, and called a cab in the hopes that I might at least save half a face. I told Collins not to touch anything and await for Lieutenant Brennan. Expense count item three, $8.75 cab fare to Greenwich Village. It was a long shot, but it could be the same girl that had known Martin. I went up the stairs of an old brownstone and knocked on the door. When it finally opened, I got the quickest scalding in history. She was wearing something thin enough to make a silkworm hang himself. Yes. I bet you had a hard time finding something to wear in July. I'm not cold-blooded. What's on your mind? I'd like to know about William Baskerville. Oh, that one. I haven't seen him in years. Maybe you've got a picture of him? I've got lots of pictures. There might be one of William somewhere. Well, let's look through the whole flock. I've got lots of time. Before I let you in, you'd better tell me your name. I don't want you to steal anything from me. Honey, if anybody stole anything from you, they'd get their fingers burned off at the elbows. Come in. She opened the door and led me into the living room, sat down. The shades were drawn, and I had a hard time finding the couch. Oh. Pardon me, I'm flying blind here. You must have studied Braille. Well, how do we look at the pictures with a magic lantern? I thought maybe you wanted to relax a minute. Put something in a glass. I'll cool down. I don't drink. Never keep the supper on. Doesn't leave you much of a field. What do you major in? Cigarettes. Have one? Yeah. I haven't got a match. Just hold on to it. It'll light up. I think I'd better get the pictures. I'll be right back. I get lonesome in the dark. I'll just be a second. Turn on the radio. Where is it? By your elbow. Oh. That's nice. Picked it out myself. You can start with these. If William isn't in this pile, I've got lots more. You're not in a hurry, are you? Not a bit. Good. This might run into overtime. We will return you to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Saddle up the sofa and ride off to adventure with CBS Radio every Saturday night. That's when most of these same stations bring you the Gene Autry Show and Bill Boyd as Hopalong Cassidy. Rustlers don't stand a chance. Crooks of the range go down under fire when those two riders for justice, Gene Autry and Hopalong Cassidy, empty their holsters. Enjoy their latest adventures tonight on CBS Radio. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we bring you the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Virginia Carter wasn't worried about working late. There was only one trouble with the job. It was tough keeping my mind on two things at once. It was like trying to read a mail order catalog in front of a blast furnace. She sat close to me and handed me one picture at a time, describing each guy in the photographs. I've seen draft boards with smaller clientele. Several times she stopped and looked at one of the pictures, smiled, and passed the guy to me. 
I was going to mention an old snapshot I had of myself when she tapped one of the collection with a polished fingernail. William Baskerville. Here he is. I figured to be sooner or later. How long ago was this taken? Well, I couldn't say exactly, but I guess about six years. You should keep a file. William was a nice guy. He had money. Showed me a good time. What else do you know about him? He has a brother with a checking account at Fort Knox. William have any unusual habits? A few. They wouldn't help you find him. Uh, well... I remember something. He used to play the saxophone. Hobby? No, not exactly. He played around town with several small bands. He used to pick me up after work and we'd go to a dive someplace and he'd sit in. He loved it. He was a nut on jazz. You make money at it? <laughs> I guess so. Before he went to work for his brother. I don't think his brother liked him playing the sax. Okay, honey, thanks. I'll stop around again sometime. Take a look at your parlor. Must been a nice, soft web. All right, if I take William with me? Not if you bring a picture back to yourself. Maybe I'll just bring a camera. You can take it yourself. Good. That's why I keep the room so dark. I hated to leave, but my hair was already curly enough. She had given me one lead. William was a musician of sorts, and sometimes he made money at it. I started across the street to catch another cab, and I was halfway there when I heard the car. It was an old trick. You drive by fast, open your door, and if anyone is in the way, he winds up with a face full of automobile. I ducked in a hurry. I picked myself up and thought about chasing him, but he was so far down the street, I couldn't even get the license number. Expense account item four, $3.35. Another cab to local 802 of the Musicians Union. I went in, and a little short guy with a twitch looked up at me from behind a big desk. Yeah, something I could do for you, Pops? That twitch? Hmm. Yeah. Too much pop. You know uh, William Baskerville plays sax? Hmm. Has he got a card? He makes money. Well, if he ain't, he better have. See if he does. I'm an old friend, and I'd like to get in touch with him. Mm -hmm. Between twitches, he found what I was looking for. William had just renewed his card. It didn't show a home address, but his mail was being sent to one of the swing joints on 52nd Street. I said thanks and left the little man in the middle of a twitch. Expense account item five, $3.85. Still another cab to the address on 52nd Street. On a table, huh? I'm looking for William Baskerville. Baskerville? Plays the sax. Yeah, he left as one of the musicians. I don't pay no attention to the music. Tone deaf. Thanks. Can I bother you for a minute? No, but you can talk to me. Move and lean on the piano. Know William Baskerville? Sure. He blows here. Where is he? He's off tonight. He got a phone call and took off. Why? I want to find him. He took off. He left rehearsal and just took off. Was he headed someplace? Sure. Sure, everybody's headed someplace. You can't go nowhere without heading someplace. I never quite looked at it that way. What time did he leave? About 4.30. What do you want Willie for? I got a message for him. You a cop? What makes you think so? I don't think so. I was just asking. I just thought maybe. Not, not for sure. What? What do you mean, what? How do you feel? Oh, the end. Sometime when I got the patience, I'll tell you all about it. But don't bug me now, though. Here's five. Come down and tell me where William Baskerville lives. I'll take the five, but I'm staying right where I am. I like you. I may cry. You're putting me on now. You've got my five. Five? Oh, yeah. What did it buy you? An address. Great. I want William Baskerville. Okay, I can't make this much longer anyway. 69 East 12th Street. Thanks. Solid. Expense account item six, cab number four. 75 cents to the home of Brother Baskerville. I climbed the stairs of a beat-up building and stopped at a door on the third floor. According to the landlord, Brother Baskerville's room was on the other side. I tried my knuckles again and put my ear to the door. I couldn't figure it out at first. It was a strange sound, the light scraping like a rope over wood. I tried the door. I'd been right on both counts. It was rope and it was rubbing on wood. Because Brother Baskerville was making the sound effects, but he was doing it the hard way. He was on one end of the rope, hanging by his neck. He was turning slowly like a weather vane in a soft breeze. 
A chair was tipped over at his feet, and there was a phone on the table. I crossed to it and was about to call Lieutenant Brenner's when I looked at the dead man again, and my stomach jumped up and kicked my mind into high gear. I walked back to him and picked up the chair. What I saw threw the suicide theory right out of the window. If he had used the chair to stand on, he would have still needed a ladder just to tie the rope to the rafters. I've seen a couple of guys that hang themselves, but never one that jumped four feet in the air to do it. I shoved the chair under him just to make sure. He cleared it by a good foot. Hello? Hello, William? He's uh, tied up right now. Who is this? Hello, hello, who is this? Sometimes you get lucky. A guy would have to be congenitally deaf to Miss Virginia Carter's lovely voice. She'd been lying when she told me she didn't know where William lived, and I just have a natural aversion to lying women, especially when they're mixed up in a murder. You guess. Expense account item seven, cab fare. $1.55 back to Greenwich in Virginia Carter's darkroom. Well, Mr. Darling, could you bring your camera? We'll play spin the bottle some other time. How'd you know my name? Why, you gave it to me this afternoon. You're a bad liar. I'm coming in. Oh, now, wait a minute. I'm expecting someone. If it's who I think it is, you better hide all the rope in the house. Now move it. <laughs> oh, oh. Heard from Collins yet? I don't know what you're talking about. Only two people have lied to me today, you and Collins. You told me you didn't know where William lived, and you called him ten minutes ago. Collins said he saw William standing in the garden with a gun, and a musician told me William didn't leave rehearsal until 4.30. I didn't leave the basketball home until 4. Get out of here. I don't know anybody named Collins. Okay, but Collins just killed William Baskerville. Oh, no. Oh, yes. He strangled him first and then stood on a chair and hung the body to a rafter. How do you know it was Colin? Because he forgot he's a foot taller than most guys. He gave William a boost, but he left him hanging too high. Wait a minute, wait a minute. He just left William waiting for oxygen. He didn't say anything about killing William. I want to get out of this mess. Then slow down and tell me everything you know. Well, I met him with William. William introduced me to him one night. After William went to prison, I started seeing Collins. And he told me that he'd been in some kind of a deal with William. He'd stolen some money, and that was why William went to prison. He went up and was supposed to split with Collins when he got out. So William came back and wanted his share, and Collins killed him, huh? I didn't know he was going to kill him. He forged some kind of a letter so that it would look like it came from Martin. That's where the letter figured. He was going to kill Carl Baskerville and blame it on William. He didn't say anything about killing anybody. He killed him and stole the letter. It looked like William had killed him and taken the letter to hide the motive. Listen, Mr. Dollar. Oh. Collins must have come in through the kitchen and started shooting. She went down like a diver with a bends and died on her face. He was trying for me when I jumped to one side and knocked over the only light burning in the room. He came close, but the flash of his gun gave him away, and I threw enough lead to fill a sink. Collins stumbled back into the kitchen, but he was dragging. I heard him drop, and I moved in after him. The moonlight slanted down through one of the windows and splashed out on the hard floor. He was lying in it, on his back. Like he wanted to get that far anyway. You'd better give it up, Colin. Yeah, forget it, forget it. No reason to kill you now. Before you close your eyes, tell me something. All right. But it won't take too long. Why didn't you go out and get William yourself? Why wait until I found him? Couldn't take the chance. I knew the old man would have somebody. Start looking sooner or later. I killed him in the garden because I knew you'd make a good wit. Probably go looking for Virginia after... He told you about her. You called her and told her to tell me everything she knew. That's right. Wanted you to find him so it looked like a suicide. You nearly got away with it. You just forgot how tall you were when you hanged William. You tried to run me down? No. I just wanted to scare you. Make you think it was William. <coughs> I'll call an ambulance. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I got, I got, got three of them. <laughs> Should be raining now. Nice the night to die. Yeah, not a cloud in the sky. It's a beautiful night. Yeah. Well, I, I can't use it. But I'll give it to you. I called Brenner's and he came over with his boys and cleaned it up. Virginia, the girl with the robes gallery, was dead. 
Collins wasn't long catching up. It was pretty simple. Collins and young Baskerville had taken 100,000 from the brother's company, and William was caught. He did six years, knowing that when he got out, there would be 50,000 waiting. In the meantime, Collins had his girl, and enough time to think that 100,000 was better if it wasn't split in the middle. Collins framed William with a letter and then started killing. Expense account item eight, $23.45 dinner and incidentals covering the rest of the night up till the bars close. Expense account item nine, $10. A massage and steam bath. Item 10, another cab to Grand Central, 65 cents. Item 11, $38.55 train fare and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, $137.27. Comments? Murder isn't so bad. A ride in any New York cab makes a killing look like a Sunday school taffy pull. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> Truly, Johnny Dollar stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen starring in the Paramount Pictures Technicolor production, Silver City. Featured in tonight's cast were Stacey Harris, Bill Boucher, Howard McNear, Sidney Miller, and Virginia Gregg. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> This is Dan Coverley inviting you to join us next week at this time when Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Edmund O'Brien again. I'd like to speak to you for a moment about one of the most important duties of American citizens. Today, every American has an opportunity to share in our common defense effort. And right now, this opportunity has become a duty for all of us. The armed forces of the United States need blood, our blood. The Korean campaign has gravely depleted the supply on hand. And this must be replenished if we are to afford our servicemen the protection they are giving us. No matter what your age, sex, or station in life, you can contribute to American defense by donating a pint of your blood to the men of your Army, Navy, Air Force, or Marines. Call your local blood donor center or Red Cross chapter today for an appointment. Remember, your donation of blood may save the life of a wounded serviceman. Give your blood today to save a life tomorrow. Archer's grandmothers are due to arrive in force to add complications to the already busy existence of America's favorite teenager. This invasion of grandmothers is scheduled for tomorrow evening when you meet Corliss Archer on most of these same CBS radio stations. Listen for the family fun with Corliss and all her friends tomorrow night. Stay tuned now for the Vaughn Monroe Show, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. And remember, True Actions fans never miss a case with Gangbusters Saturday night on the CBS Radio Network.